Welcome back to my course, uh, Socialism. As always, let me remind to you what we did uh, last time. Remember, last time we continued our conversation about late Stalinism, or in other words, National Bolshevism, when cosmopolitan internationalist, internationalist socialism was indigenized, adjusted to the conditions of the Soviet Union, and how Stalin tried to dance between the multinational nature of the Soviet Union and uh, catering to the interests of the Russian majority. Out of these attempts, uh, the Soviet multi-ethnic empire emerged, where the Russian ethnic component was used as a building block to construct this uh, Soviet slash Russian patriotism. Okay, it was definitely a project that acquired nationalistic features. Uh, on top of this, we mentioned that uh, Stalin sealed the borders of the Soviet Union, uh, and at the very end of his life. He promoted xenophobia within the country, trying to get rid of all Western influences, all Western influences, which were considered harmful for the body, for the body of this socialist nation called the Soviet Union. And the um, extreme manifestation of this xenophobic evolution of the Stalinist regime was... Uh, the anti-Semitic campaign against uh, so-called uh, rootless cosmopolitans when uh, groups of uh, Jewish doctors were expelled from their jobs and some were arrested and put in prison. It was definitely a dictatorial regime which until the death of Stalin, which happened in 1953, was uh, the magnet for all progressive forces of the world. Strange as it may sound, today you might be surprised, but if you look at the documents, uh, media at that time, even those people who did not exactly endorse the Stalinist uh, cruel uh, regime, that dictatorial regime, totalitarian regime. Still, they believed he was um, a friendly force, a friendly force that was working to promote this progressive agenda. Okay, yes, with the uh, helter skelter attitude. Yes, with the collectivization that took uh, huge human toll, a few million peasants, but still working for progressive cores, okay? And we talked about the numerous Western acolytes who admired Stalin. Today, we are going to talk uh, the second major country, which literally cloned, copied the Stalinist regime and um, built Stalinism on a wider scale, on a bigger scale, on a grand scale, amplified whatever had been done in the Soviet Russia, in this country, everything was amplified, of course, in the magnitude of human suffering, uh, the magnitude of people who were sacrificed for this um, communist cause in this country we're going to discuss today. Was the proof that it was the Stalinist model at the time that was considered the mainstream, okay? Of course, some social democrats in the West had questions about, they criticized it, but still, I repeat, it was the uh, second major model of socialism, okay, social democracy and communism, two major models of socialism in the 20th century. And before the second country joined this communist camp, it was only the Soviet Union, which uh, was the manifestation of this model. And now another country came to manifest the same Stalinist model, status socialism or communism. 
and the name of this country is China. China. So our conversation today is about China and how China, in the wake of the Second World War, um, built up this communist regime, which became friends with the Soviet Union, and how this communist regime essentially exercised the indigenous support. Millions of pe people on the ground, peasants, sympathized with this regime. Okay, I want to emphasize this. Because occasionally you may see, especially in uh, among uh, in the writings, articles, and books which are very critical of socialism and communism, you uh, can see this uh, notion that uh, communism was a sort of imposition; it was imposed from up above. Okay, whether we like it or not, but um, communism was not imposed on China. It was a pretty much indigenous phenomenon. I repeat, the regime, the Chinese communist regime did exercise the Soviet support, yes, but essentially the facts and how uh, people um, acted shows that uh, Chinese peasants did embrace this model. Okay, of course, they didn't know what it was to bring to them. Okay, they became later when communism <laughs> was introduced in China uh, a couple of decades later. Many of them started to regret, but still, pretty much it was their choice, which is very different, by the way, from uh, Soviet U Union or Russia, if you wish, where uh, communism did enjoy support in major cities, towns, but did not have... Uh, much support in the countryside. So that is why Stalin had to literally uh, declare war on the countryside, sending their army and the army and the secret police, imposing collectivization on peasants. Here in China, I repeat, it was um, communism was more grounded in the countryside, enjoyed more popular support, at least in the beginning. And Chinese communism Unlike uh, Soviet communism, it was overwhelmingly peasant communism. And in fact, later, uh, Chairman Mao, that was the leader of the Chinese communist movement, or we can call him uh, Chinese Stalin, he advertised Chinese communism as a sort of peasant communism. Peasant communism, okay? Unlike uh, Soviet Marxism-Leninism, which uh, argued that it was the union of uh, industrial workers and peasants as sidekicks. That was the force to bring, to build communism in Russia. See, in this alliance in Russia between workers and peasants, workers ideologically were to play the major role, guided by the Communist Party, of course. So the industrial workers were considered the salt of the earth. The Chinese communism did accept the same paradigm about industrial workers being the salt of the earth, and that Chinese communists kept repeating this. But since there was hardly any industrial working class in China, because China was a very much, a very backward country, even compared to... Um, the Russian Empire, or later the Soviet Union, where there was a bunch of illiterate peasants, China was even more backward economically. There were more illiterate people here in China. Okay, so that is why there was no, there was hardly any industrial working class to gamble on. So, and eventually Mao, the head of the communist movement in China, and his associates. They had to come up with this indigenous idea of Chinese communism. And again, trying to customize Chinese communism to ch trying to cu um, customize Marxist Leninism, what they copied from the Soviet Union to the Chinese soil. Gradually, Mao came to this idea to 
advertise this uh, Chinese peasants as the salt of the earth. Okay. And the Chinese communism in 1960s, 1970s became known as the thir in the third world as the peasant communism. And uh, by the way, that was one of the reasons why uh, Maoists, again, that's how they became known. It's a nickname for Chinese communists, Maoists, after the head of the communist movement, Mao. That is why Maoists became popular in the third world, because many third world countries which declared uh, socialist or communist orientation, they looked up to China because China was the uh, a third world country with a predominantly peasant population. And so China's version of communism for a while had a great appeal. But let's start with um, making a short excursion to the Chinese history. Okay. We need to know something about China's historical background in order to understand, again, the development of the Chinese communist. Chinese communist. First of all, we have to remember about, the, about this fact, which you may have learned in your major courses on world history, okay, Asian history, that China was a very much isolated country. From the east, from the west, from the south, jungles in the west mountains, in the East um, uh, Yellow Sea and the North, North China was isolated by the Great Wall of China. Okay, so historically Chinese uh, developed, it's a part of Chinese culture, this strong suspicion of foreigners, modern reforms, and China was a very much economically underdeveloped country. It was an empire, okay, like Russian empire, by the way, okay. Until 1911, China was an empire, and um, challenges of the modern world created this ten uh, ten uh, uh, tensuous situation in China when uh, much of the elites didn't want any changes, all the elites, whereas intellectuals, Chinese intellectuals, some uh, small number of students, there was a small student population, wanted changes, wanted to modernize China, make it modern somehow. Okay. 90% of people were peasants. Since China was a very much economically backward country, it became an easy prey for Western powers. Not only for Western powers, but also for Japan, and at some point for Russia, even Russia was herself a, a backward country, trying to industrialize herself. Okay. Um, at some point, um, uh, Russian Empire and uh, Japan, which was able to quickly modernize herself, they were even they were fought over Chinese territory. Who would dominate uh, northeastern part of uh, north e northeastern part of China? Okay, look at this map. So, in 1904, and um, in this particular area, northeastern China called Manchuria, Japanese and Russian Empire challenged each other. And Japan actually won this war, defeated the Russian. That's how Japan took over this area. So Japan took over northeastern China, Manchuria, okay, parts of this area. Um, England, even before uh, Japan took over northeastern part of China, um, Japan, uh, China became the object of uh, aggressive policies of Britain and France. Okay, Britain unleashed against China so-called opium wars. Again, the reason it's called opium wars is because the wars, there were two wars, two opium wars. The wars uh, were started over um, smuggling opium. British smugglers smuggled opium in China and the Chinese government wanted to shut down this um, illegal trade. And the British government essentially uh, decided to protect uh, the smugglers and the major demand on the part of Britain was don't be so insulated, don't be so isolated, okay? Open your country for a foreign trade, okay? But the Chinese were so xenophobic, so suspicious of foreigners, 
they said we don't need anything from you these damn westerners get out so we want to keep our country shut down so britain actually unleashed the war against china and defeated china okay france joined the second opium war against china and china lost control over her coastal cities all coastal cities were occupied by foreign powers <coughs> excuse me england uh, controlled this area lucrative area and then also tibet uh, there was france here this yellow whatever is colored and yellow color was controlled by france germany jumped on the bandwagon again russia you can see again japan eventually took it over from russia okay <clears throat> and um china had no control over her coastal cities so foreigners created their own headquarters here even foreign currency was circulating in coastal cities in coastal cities foreigners um foreigners uh, had their own administration so chinese government did not have a right to uh, charge customs duties can you imagine so basically entire coastal part of china was controlled by this commonwealth of western powers plus japan and uh, russia okay well, of course when revolu revol the revolution happened in russia in 1970 it was only japan and western powers who remained to control these coastal cities the reason i am emphasizing this i want to show and kind of make a point that uh, among the educated people of china primarily students scribes okay intellectuals was um, strong animosity toward toward the western countries a strong animosity toward the west because the west see abused china subjugated it on the other hand there was a strong desire to modernize china to make it modern to challenge this uh, the western domination okay and that's what eventually uh, sealed the fate of uh, so-called the Manchu Empire that existed in China again Manchu why Manchu because again these people from Manchuria northeastern China it's a, a small group of people who were distantly related to the Chinese in 1611 or 1617 in 1600 they took over China and essentially established a dynasty that ruled the china until 1911 okay 1911 partially the manchu people were assimilated into the chinese society okay anyway um 1911 ch in 1911 china saw a uh, revolution okay a revolution that was led by the scribes intellectuals some bureaucrats chinese bureaucrats who first didn't like the manchu dynasty because it was blamed in being anti-national in keeping china backward and the second revolution was driven by the desire to uh, fight against the westerners who subjugated china okay so in 1911 this old dynasty was overthrown manchu dynasty okay that was the end of the chinese empire revolution and um, spontaneously a political party was formed called Kuomintang Kuomintang okay that's how it's pronounced I before I came here to do it I um, even googled it and did pronunciation because I uh, I've been teaching this uh, stuff not as part of this course socialism but the general course on world history uh, where i also mentioned china and this political party and i always made the mistake wanted to learn how to do it so kumintang which means national party so a party that wanted to protect national interest of china goal to make china a modern powerful nation okay this guy whose picture you see his name uh, was sun yat-sen an intellectual chinese intellectual um he was a uh, he was a christian by the way he studied in the united states okay so he was in charge but um the power of Kuomintang was only formal in uh, in coastal areas by the way in coastal areas and parts of inland china 
these were the only areas where Kuomintang was able to exercise control. The rest of China um, fell apart into war, um, into the hands of warlords. Okay, it became divided into, let's say, like eleven lordships. Okay, and nominal essential government uh, was able headed by Sun Yat-sen, was able to uh, dominate life in China only in central, in, the, in um, coastal areas. The rest of China was split into these war lordships. Okay. Then uh, after Sun Yat-sen died, this Kuomintang split in two movements, in two parts. Okay. And this is essential. That's what defined the, the history of China in 1920s, 1930s, and the 1940s. Okay, so Kuomintang Party, National Party, divided in two parts. One maintained the name Kuomintang, National Party. Okay, and the second major wing of Kuomintang became known as the Communist Party. Communist Party. Okay. In fact, the first communist groups in China emerged in 1912, oh, I'm sorry, 1919, when the Communist International in Moscow was set up, okay? Remember this international alliance of communists to promote the world revolution. So in China, there were some students, intellectuals who sympathized with communism and who thought that uh, by embracing communism, they would be able to kill two birds with one stone. First, they would be able to liberate the country and kick out these hated foreigners, Westerners, and Japanese, of course. And the second thing, they would be able to establish this equality and justice, social justice, okay, this double goal. Okay? And the first wing, Kuomintang, was headed by a guy named Chiang Kai-shek. I will tell you a few words about him. But the second wing that became known as the Communist Party was headed by Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong, okay, a charismatic leader. And I will also tell you about him, who he was. Uh, the major thing is that Kuomintang proper started to gamble on middle class people, on coastal cities, some urban people, okay, bureaucrats and middle class people, state servants or state clerks who worked for municipal governments, okay, collected taxes, and middle class people, okay, some business people. Communists eventually started to gamble on uh, students, primarily students, radical students, and peasants. Late in 1930s, 1940s, peasants, even uh, more on peasants. At first, it was radical groups of students, and then more and more and more communists were becoming popular among the peasants, especially after 1934. I'm sorry, after 1937, I will tell you what happened in the middle of 1930s. Okay, so first about this guy named Chiang Kai-shek who uh, headed Kuomintang proper. Okay. He was a military man, officer, and Christian, pro-business, pro-Western, and um, didn't like communists, but didn't speak against them open at first. Okay. And again, he controlled the coastal areas. The reason I want I uh, emphasize in his heritage is to let you know that eventually it worked against him because he was a Christian. Again, Christianity was associated with being a Westerner. Pro-business, a personal property, which in the eyes of Chinese peasants was uh, what? Um, like a scarlet letter, eh? Because, and you will find out about it, I will tell you more, I will emphasize this, and I already told you, China was predominantly peasant country and a very poor country, okay? Horrible poverty, horrible poverty. So there was a natural jealousy and um, hatred of the rich people, or at least well-to-do people, okay, both in the countryside and the cities. <clears throat> the second guy, 
Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. Here you can see him talking to peasants. He was not a military man. He was a villager. He came from a countryside. He came from a peasant family, which worked well for him because he gambled on his peasant origin. Yes, of course, his um, background didn't fit this Marxist paradigm, right? He was not an industrial worker. But he was a peasant. From a peasant family. Um, unfortunately, his father was a well-to-do peasant. But Mao Zedong later downplayed this. He simply said, my father was a peasant. Uh, his father was able to give him education. So he goes to a um, city. Mao Zedong and received an education and then he comes back he becomes a village teacher Mao Zedong was never exposed to Western civilization Western culture okay and of course he was not a Christian I forgot to tell you that see I needed to tell you this in the beginning China was a predominant Confucian country where Confucianism, you if, if you don't know Confucianism, it's an ancient religion that goes back to, uh, can be traced to Confucius, uh, this philosopher, okay, a sage who had established this religion in 500 BC, okay, or BC, I don't know what, what how do we do, how we do chronology right now, okay, in order to make sure that nobody's upset. But anyway, um, in ancient times, uh, Confucianism had been established, and it, Confucianism as a, can cannot be totally called a religion. It's a more a moral philosophy about how to make a good life on this earth. I'm going to emphasize it again. Confucianism was not about other world like Abrahamic religions. Uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Okay, Confucianism was and is about how to lead a morally good life, how to make a good life on this earth. Okay, when Confucius had been asked about the other world, he said, "I don't care about gods. Nobody knows if they exist or not. What I care about is how to make." Uh, people good morally good and how to build a good life on this earth okay I the reason I'm emphasizing it is to let you know up front why communism became so successful in China you cannot deny this I want to stress this that eventually when in modern age Communism came to China. Even though communists denounced religion, including Chinese communists. Even though Mao Zedong and Chinese communists denounced Confucianism, still the general message of traditional religion, that to lead a morally good life, to build a good life on this earth, that's a message of Confucianism, worked extremely well for communism, okay? And I'm jumping ahead here to kind of throw to you this idea, which I um, constantly argue. One of the reasons why communism is still so popular in China to the present day, communism. Even though today China is a um, partially market country, partially, I repeat, communism as an ideology, even though it's, it, had, it had been decomposed, it's still there. Okay. And one of the reasons, I think, in my view, why communism is still so popular in China is because it's like a glove, fits this traditional Chinese spiritual mindset. That's my argument, okay? Okay, to be exact, I need also to mention, in all fairness, that in the process of history, in the uh, Middle Ages, later, Confucianism, blended with uh, Buddhism, which also came uh, to dominate parts of China, and uh, so-called Taoism, okay? Taoism talks about spirits, and Buddhism also talks about gods, although um, Buddhism is not a 
monotheistic religion, right? So in China, Confucianism mixed with the Buddhism and Taoism, but still, the major argument I made, <clears throat> I would like you to remember that uh, the most ancient traditional Chinese spirituality, Confucianism, did create prerequisites uh, in modern times for China to embrace communism. Okay, let's go back to Mao Zedong, that's Chairman Mao, as he became known to the Chinese people. He was a very charismatic person who was uh, in the communist movement as early as 1919. There was a group, a small student group called May the Fourth Movement. It's a movement of uh, radical left students who pursued these two goals, which I said before, to, uh, to uh, kick out foreigners from China, and second, to establish the social justice in China. Okay. Look at this first bullet point on this slide, okay? For these guys like Mao Zedong, who set up this movement, May the, fir May the 4th Movement, 1919, eventually, uh, which eventually evolved into the Communist Movement, and the Communist Party was created that became the uh, one of the branches of Common turn communist international. Okay. The goal of communists was to liberate the country from foreigners, to overcome economic backwardness, and of course, to establish this uh, social justice, equality. So we see this um, um, national, nationalistic goal. Okay. It wasn't total. Um, social justice it, there was an obvious national goal nationalistic goal Kuomintang and communist party occasionally maintained peace but they also frequently fought each other and killed each other the soviet union occupied an interesting position toward the communist party and Kuomintang. since the major threat to the soviet union remember stalin was building national Bolshevism. He was going to protect the national interest of the Soviet Union. And Japan in the Far East was the major threat. That's how Stalin viewed it. In Asia, the major threat was Japan. Okay. So one of the reasons why eventually the United States and the Soviet Union eventually banded together against Japan. Okay. So since Japan was the major threat to the Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Union wanted to unite all possible forces against Japan. That is why, ironically, Soviet Union supported militarily both Kuomintang, that was a pro-business middle-class party, and the Communist Party. So pr he provided guns, aviation, machine guns, cartridges to both sides. Okay. Um, the Soviet Union tried to force these forces, these two parts, these two movements, Kuomintang and Communist Party, to stay together. Okay, And um, Stalin believed that since China was a backward country, it didn't have yet industrial working class. So on the Marxist grading scale, remember Marxist uh, teaching had this um, scheme that humans should develop through these uh, stages of development primitive communism slavery feudalism capitalism and then under capitalism we have uh, industrial working class uh, that revolts against capitalism headed by communist party they bring the dictatorship of proletariat and according to this scheme, this working class people begins to build communism, helped by allies, okay, there's some backward allies like peasants who should be tamed, navigated, educated, okay. That was the scheme, Marxist-Leninist scheme, okay. So the major prerequisite, Stalin still shared this traditional Marxist viewpoint that the major prerequisite for a country to become um, to build socialism, even to build socialism, to have a full-fledged uh, socialist society, to have a 
a communist revolution, uh, a country needed to have a, um, a strong industrial working class. Okay, since China did not have a powerful industrial class, industrial working class, according to Stalin, this country wasn't ripe yet for a communist revolution, but it was ripe for a democratic revolution. So he believed that at this point, he was talking about 1930s, 1940s. At this point, at that point, uh, Chinese communists uh, should uh, bend together with this bourgeois party, Kuomintang, and they should take power together. And later, communists should squeeze out Kuomintang from power. So that was the message, the general uh, job communists were to perform in uh, China. But Chinese communists didn't want to wait. They viewed Kuomintang as an, uh, as an enemy. Okay, they didn't like them. Communists and Mao Zedong wanted to take power right away. Okay, so <laughs> to be exact, these um, junior part partners of the Soviet communists, the Chinese, they wanted to run ahead of the communist train. Eh? They wanted to jump ahead of the communist train. Stalin, in fact, at this point, uh, told them, hold your horses, you know, don't rush, you know, see? Uh, ironically, Stalin was a, uh, a moderate person in this case, in this particular case. But of course, I repeat, it was more explained by geopolitical interests of Stalin, who wanted to mobilize all possible forces against Japan, okay? Um, at one point, particularly in 1934, Kuomintang mobilized its, its forces and unleashed an overwhelming military attack against communists. So there was a war and communists were not well armed at that time. Uh, Kuomintang had uh, more trained military on their side and Chinese communists only had peasants and students. They had to escape to inland areas. Communists had to escape to inland areas through mountains, crossing turbulent rivers, again mountains. And they, they entered a very remote area called Yan'an, uh, in, um, located in the uh, highly ele elevated area infested with caves. There was a bunch of caves here. That is why the uh, Chinese communists chose this area to hide. So they wanted to hide from Kuomintang and from the Japanese. Okay, But at the same time, they wanted to be close enough to <laughs> the Chinese capital. See, Beijing, capital of China, just in case, in order to wait for an appropriate moment to raid the capital. Okay. A good strategic location. So here, communists of China recuperated, mobilized the forces. But before they reached this area, their uh, army, communist army, about 34,000 people, they were marching through mountains. Um, during this march, they had to fight against Kuomintang forces. They lost a lot of people, and eventually about 5,000 people reached Yan'an. So... Uh, so-called the Lone March, that's how it became known in the history of the Chinese Communist Party. To the present day, this episode is glorified, romanticized in official Chinese history books. So if you go to China, if you live there, if you dig into the Chinese books, you will see how, even though we have a lot of changes in recent China, it's not, of course, diehard uh, communist country. It's not even a diehard socialist country. It's a, I would say, today partially decomposed socialism. Right? The best way to describe China today, I'm jumping ahead here, is to call it a national socialist country. That's the best way to describe it. Anyway, um, still to the present day, this episode in the Chinese history is glorified as the most romantic, heroic page in the history of Chinese communism. Okay. And since today, still to the present day, the Communist Party of China occupies the dominant position um, 
dominates entire political power, CCP, Communist, Chinese Communist Party, the only force that controls the Chinese. So they still hammer in the minds of the people this heroic story uh, the, about this, uh, the Lone March. A Lone March essentially is viewed by the Chinese Communist ideology as um, a crucible, crucible of this national communism of China, where this um, the communist body was forged the body of the chinese communism so basically by overcoming these uh, elements of nature fighting against kumintan forces we became cleansed we polished our uh, communist character before we reached these caves area yanai so we went through this crucible and we became that like Ironclad communists, so to speak. Okay, <clears throat> to the present day, Chinese communist bureaucrats obligated to go to these areas where they have museums, you know, like exhibits uh, telling about this glorious story, heroic story of Chinese Communist Party, and uh, communist um, bureaucrats, activists, propaganda workers still had to go to these areas where they exposed to this propaganda so it's still pretty much in force in present day china you know it's another issue whether people believe this uh, bs or not but still it's the official doctrine you know and the story is still there about the long march <clears throat> so as a result of this uh, crucible when uh, Mao Zedong and his party recuperated in the caves of Yan'an. They eventually created this philosophy of uh, Chinese peasant communism. Since um, the assumption was that since we do not have yet a developed industrial working class, we are going to gamble on peasants, Chinese peasants, a truly socialist force. They are going to be the major revolutionary class. Okay. No revolution would succeed without them. So essentially, he didn't say it, but he implied it. He implied it, Mao Zedong. He implied that the Chinese peasants would be able to play a role of surrogate, surrogate proletarian, surrogate industrial working class. See, that's how it works. <clears throat> okay, I mentioned this. Already, so I'm not going to keep your attention. Whatever you see in the slide, I articulated. <clears throat> Unfortunately for Comintan, Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of Comintan, he did not have popular support. Why? Because China was a peasant country. 90% of people were peasants. Only in coastal areas. He had some support among well-to-do people, bureaucrats, and middle class, okay, professionals. But Maoists, so those people who were Chinese communists who followed Mao Zedong, they were winning support of peasants. In that area which you saw on the map, see this area, Yan'an area, as early as the 1930s, okay, in the Yan'an area, they divided land among peasants. They liberated women, which was very important because women were very much subjugated in China. Of course, they didn't have to wear like a hijab or a veil, you know, like <laughs> were not clad like in Middle Eastern, Eastern countries. Still, they were very much subordinated, unlike uh, European countries or even Russia, not exactly uh, <clears throat> At that time, in early 20th century, female-friendly country, but still, even compared to um, Russian Empire, China was uh, the country where women were relegated literally to uh, to objects. Okay, the people were selling and buying wives. Okay, peasants were selling their daughters frequently into servitude. Okay, there were these um, uh, traditional um, expectations about women of course uh, 
they could not participate in any social life okay they could not divorce okay because a man had uh, the only person uh, who had uh, something to say about family life you know so a woman could not initiate a divorce a woman could not own property a woman couldn't um, own a land plot so what the communists did when they were living in caves in 1930s they said hey women you are free you are equal with men so you have to be educated um so you can also work the land plots uh, when we are going to win the country we're going to distribute land and you will be working uh, on the land you are you are going to hold the land okay and they actually confiscated uh all um landlords lands in this area Yanan, and distributed them among the peasants and that's what brought that's what brought um chinese communists to wide support because peasants uh, spread the story that communists were given land to the people okay so communists did confiscate the land the big um property owners uh, seized the lands and distributed these lands among the peasants okay <clears throat> they didn't talk in 1930s about nationalization of the land they didn't talk yet about collective farms okay see because they wanted to enjoy peasant support when Jap japan was defeated the civil war started in china see when the world war was over a civil war started in china that is why by the way when um, today western books or some russian books they uh, they talk about the second world war that we have to celebrate the end of second world war it doesn't fly in china why because the war only started for china or war better to say continued escalated after uh, 1945 okay in 1930s there was um, a dormant war with uh, a lot of action uh, only between the japanese and Kuomintang, okay with occasional fights between the japanese and communists and communists against Kuomintang. But the full-fledged the war started in 1945 between Kuomintang and communists. Okay, Stalin was kind of observing this, and he was not exactly happy about this because his orders were to Mao Zedong just try to make peace with Kuomintang, but Mao wanted to exercise the total power. Okay, he was he wanted to be the only one to win power in china he and his uh, associates and since peasants majority of peasants sided with communists the fate of uh chiang kai-shek and kamintan was sealed was sealed okay so quickly communists enjoying the popular support they kicked out kamintan and kamintan had to escape had to escape to the taiwan taiwan area okay present-day Taiwan that's how China became uh, a country of two states to the present day China actually it's a country of two states two governments a Western type government constitutional go government on Taiwan created by Kuomintang and the communist still dictatorship in mainland China but the fact of life was that with an overwhelming support of the Chinese population, Mao and communists did win all over China. With the partial support of the Soviets, Soviets did give them guns, everything, but there was no direct support from the Soviets because Stalin was a bit itchy about uh, Mao victory. That's strange as it may sound, because he thought it would uh, uh, destroy the unity of these progressive forces in China so he didn't want to phase out Kuomintang at this point yet not yet maybe in like five ten years when communists would ground themselves in Chinese soil but the Chinese communists wanted more radical approach okay and they did and they did have their way <laughs> overriding Stalin's orders yes that's what happened and the Stalin in this case in this case he couldn't say anything because it was a huge country a country what one billion people right 
It wasn't Yugoslavia where, remember last time we talked about Joseph Bros. Tito and how Stalin wasn't happy about Joseph Bros. Tito, a communist dictator who didn't consult with Stalin about his geopolitical decisions. In the case of China, Stalin couldn't do it because it was a huge country. The communist movement in China was huge and powerful. So he had to accept it. And then eventually, of course, he became happy that communists won and there were no troubles and Mao turned out to be right from a communist viewpoint. You know, it worked well. Mao Zedong became the dictator of China and the communist party was the only one to dominate political force. And essentially, Mao started doing what Stalin had done since 1929. Okay, so Mao decided to clone, to imitate Stalin. Remember, we talked about Stalin's revolution, um, Stalin's dictatorship that became entrenched after 1929. And remember, Stalin was doing these three magic communist things. What, what are these three ma magic communist things? Collectivization, industrialization, cultural revolution. That's what Stalin was doing in 1930s, 19. 1940s, primarily 1930s, of course, 1929, 1940, to be exact. And that's what Mao wanted to do in China, because Mao cloned Stalinist model. It was uh, a clone. It was um, an attempt to plant Stalinist model in China. Okay. I want to emphasize it again because in um, sometimes when you go on Google, read about Mao, about Chinese communism, and partially we need to blame Chinese propaganda. They promote this image. They try to uh, argue that, oh, Chinese communism just sprang up on its own. Okay, Yes, Chinese communism was an indigenous phenomenon, but the model ideological model that was indigenized and nationalized. It was Stalinist model, Marxism, Leninism. Okay. It's like if you go, let's say to what Latin America, a yeah, Catholic area. Of course, you can say that Chilean, Brazilian, Peruvian Catholicism, it's an indigenous Catholicism, right? But still, it's a Catholicism that was brought from Spain. The same thing is here. I'm just giving you an example to compare how it was done. A similar thing we can see in case of the uh, Marxist-Leninist Marxist -Leninist creed that was brought to China as a form of secular religion and planted by the Chinese communists themselves and planted in the Chinese soil. But still, it was... The Stalinist model. Stalinist model. Okay. So please remember about this. And it's important to remember because to the present day, the way China's Communist Party organized with Politburo, nomenclature, the way local bureaucrats report to the central power, their pyramid of power with the dictator on the top. Okay. It had been copied from the Soviet Union. It had been copied from the Soviet Union. Okay. So, of course, Soviets became happy. Okay. That 25% of the world population went communist, right? But the U.S. was scared to death. At that time, there was Truman administration, Democratic administration. They were scared to death. And in fact, one of the reasons why Harry Truman lost to Eisenhower because he was unfairly blamed. There was no substance in this, but he was blamed by Republicans and uh, all the enemies, his enemies within the Democratic Party, that he lost China to the Soviet Union. That's what people held against Truman. You know, he was blamed for losing China. It was total nonsense because Communism was a natural choice of the Chinese people, Chinese peasants. Okay, Truman could not lose China. Okay, the fact that 
coming down and Chiang Kai-shi were literally kicked out and had to escape to Taiwan Island. It was the choice of the Chinese people. Okay, that's it. Um, briefly, we can see an enjoyable moment for communists. So the, com the world of communism enjoyed its um, heyday. Okay, Mao Zedong and Stalin were presented as two major leaders okay, of the communist movement. There were thousands of posters published in the Soviet Union and China where Mao and Stalin were depicted together. Even clothing, see the clothing and clothing style. Mao tried to imitate his predecessor, his senior comrade, right? See that? Uh, this military type uh, uh, tunic, tunic, I don't know how it's called, uh, a kaftan tunic, um, this paramilitary uniform. Okay. Mao did come with a visit to the Soviet Union and uh, he hoped that Stalin himself would come to meet him. But um, Stalin also had his own game to play, so he sent one of his chief lieutenants to meet Mao at the railroad station. So the Mao was a little bit upset, but still uh, a week later, Stalin did accept him. Okay, so uh, Mao was marooned. He was observed by uh, Stalin's secret police to check him out, you know, because, you know, Stalin was a paranoid old man. He didn't trust anybody. Okay, especially after the fact that uh, Mao didn't listen to him okay even though it worked well so everybody was happy china was seized by communists still originally the formerly mao went against uh, stalin's advice to keep alliance with Kuomintang. okay so reluctantly stalin kind of uh, sub uh, <clears throat> put down his ego or at least decided to accept things as they were i doubt that he was ready to subside uh, so put down his ego okay he had a cult of personality okay he simply decided to accept things as they were since china became a communist so it's good so a week later he did receive mao and here on this picture you can see them uh, together like clapping their hands a bunch of um, stamps were issued on this occasion again where Mao and Ch Mao and Stalin were depicted together. At the request of Stalin, Mao enters the Korean War. Okay, remember Korean War when uh, another Asian dictator, uh, Stalin's puppet, uh, Kim Il Sung, Kim Il Sung, a Korean dictator, was planted in Northern Korea by Stalin in 1945. Okay, he was. Kim Il Sun, the founder of the of this uh, Kim dynasty, Kim Il Sun, he was a captain in the Soviet army, in the Red Army. He was a Korean who, in 1930s, escaped to uh, Soviet Union. Somehow was able to avoid the, the Great Terror, and he was uh, groomed by the Soviet secret police to become a potential agent. So he uh, had the rank of captain, and this guy was planted. Uh, in North Korea, okay, to become the, the dictator, and he's, he founded the dynasty. So today's uh, uh, communist leader of North Korea, what's his name, uh, <clears throat> Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-un, he is the uh, grandson of this guy who, who was the Soviet captain who was planted by Stalin to be a North Korean dictator. So this guy, North Korean dictator, decided to take over the entire career. And uh, since Southern Korea was liberated by the American troops, okay, the Northern part was liberated by Soviet troops who brought this dictator to power. When Soviet troops retreated, and when part of American troops retreated, he decided to suddenly attack the Southern part and took to take over the entire Korean Peninsula. But uh, South Koreans who didn't like communists, who didn't want communists, they started to resist. Again, U.S. troops were brought, more U.S. troops were brought to uh, South Korea. So a bloody war started. 
a bloody war between North Korean communists and uh, U.S. troops, essentially. Since uh, North Koreans were few, they decided against the United States, uh, <clears throat> okay, they decided to ask the Soviet Union to help them. But Stalin didn't want to directly be involved into this war against the Americans. So Stalin essentially asked Mao Zedong and the Chinese communists to step in to provide the manpower to North Korea. And Mao Zedong sent millions, millions of um, Chinese soldiers, communist soldiers to North Korea, okay, uh, which was very helpful so Americans could not overcome this human tide, human tide, okay. And that's how eventually a compromise was developed along this, uh, what, 28th parallel. A border was drawn, which survived to the present day. Career is still divided, okay? The uh, reason it was divided was these events, which I just described, this Korean War, okay? Um, anyway, the reason I'm mentioning this war, again, is to let you know that the involvement in the Korean War radicalized the Chinese communist regime, okay? Mao needed money to fight this war. He wanted to extract this money, so he started to uh, impose huge taxes on the middle class, uh, business people. And eventually, he started to, Mao, Mao, started to confiscate um, private, uh, big private farms, landlords' properties. He confiscated um, any big enterprises. Again, there were very few industrial enterprises, mostly textile factories. So everything was nationalized and became state property. Okay. And at this point, Mao started to encourage peasants to join collective farms. Okay. Not by force yet, but just encouraging Chinese peasants to join collective farms. And the taxes increased to fund the war, ongoing war. And the general warfare radicalized the Chinese communist regime. Okay, so they had no peaceful, uh, they didn't have a peaceful period to recuperate. So they were fighting these numerous wars, 1930s, 1940s, and plus immediately after they took over power, they became involved into this Korean War. So we have this ongoing military mobilization which contributed to what to uh, the growth of the totalitarian regime in China. Okay, that's the point I'm trying to make. The militarized society, militarized system encouraged this totalitarian pattern. Plus the communist ideology itself, which was a totalitarian by its essence. Okay. In the meantime, Stalin dies. In fact, some historians say that Stalin actually was planning to use nuclear weapons against the U.S. because, again, there was a tie. Neither side could win during Korean War, like 1953. But fortunately, he died. Again, we cannot, we may speculate, of course, whether he wanted to use nuclear war or not, this paranoid dictator Stalin. But he died in March 1953, and everything changed. Everything changed. First, we have a new person in power in the Soviet Union. A guy, I mentioned his name last time, a guy named Nikita Khrushchev, who did not represent this unaccessible sphinx, this red pope as Stalin was. Remember, red pope in quotation marks, of course, a metaphor. Stalin was never accessible to regular people. He uh, lived in Kremlin, insulated from um, everybody so he only with a small circle of people had access to him so he um, promoted this image of a wise man who was working day and night for the sake of soviet people but he didn't mingle with people okay stalin didn't never mingle um, once or twice a year he showed up in front of big crowds during this uh, secular holidays of communism, May the 1st and uh, November the 7th. It's the day of the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917. There's two big days. 
Stalin showed up um, in front of big crowds on the top of mausoleum. Remember, mausoleum was the marble building like pyramid with Lenin's body inside, okay? <clears throat> this uh, a symbol of the communist religion, communist political religion. But mostly Stalin was an inaccessible sphinx, okay, so to speak. Unlike Stalin, Khrushchev was an easygoing guy who liked to mingle with people. And the pictures actually I uh, showing you here is just to make a point. He was the first to make a point that he liked to mingle with people, okay? Of course, he was um, a dictator, but he was not a totalitarian dictator. You know, we can call him an author authoritarian, but he did liberalize a bit, a little bit, liberalize the Stalinist regime without changing, without making uh, big economic changes. Okay, he kind of polished a little bit the body of communism, liberalized a tiny bit, not much. Okay, uh, Khrushchev. Remember, I told you last time that Khrushchev started destalinization. He actually called Stalin a criminal. Okay, but it was a very limited destalinization. For example, Khrushchev said that um, Stalin was um, a horrible person. He was responsible for creating his cult of personality. We should denounce it, and it was done. Stalin's uh, writings were shredded, eliminated, phased out. Um, Khrushchev also shut down uh, gulag concentration camps, released political prisoners, millions of political prisoners were released, okay, by Khrushchev. Uh, Khrushchev said, we need to go back to the roots, to the sacred books of uh, Marxism, Leninism, it means books of Marx and Lenin, so let's just shred, phase out Stalin's books, and let's go back to the roots. What Khrushchev was doing became known as a thaw, thaw. Thaw, it's like when the snow or ice was thawed, kind of made a little bit of changes, okay? Not complete change, but a little bit of changes. So, destalinization was only limited. Destalinization never uh, touched the communism as an ideology. So, the point Khrushchev made that we need to... Uh, liberalize a little bit communism okay we need to eliminate terror so we don't need terror we need to think about the needs of consumers regular people okay so that's what khrushchev said we need to build apartments for regular people we need um give them more to eat you know they shouldn't starve yet. in addition to emphasizing heavy industry, which was the big deal for Stalin. Remember industrialization. Stalin said, we need to pay attention to consumer industry. Not much was done in this respect, but at least he started conversation. Okay, He was a conversation starter. So we need to think about consumer needs and, again, um, <clears throat> automobile industry started under Khrushchev you know, to give people a chance to have private cars. Uh, refrigerators, TV sets, this type of stuff. The first um, blocks uh, of apartments on a mass scale were built in the Soviet Union, millions of apartments. So something was done for regular consumers. Welfare was expanded for regular people. Okay, But it was a very limited destalinization because uh, Khrushchev never denounced Stalin's collectivization. He said it was good. In fact, Khrushchev said Stalin was good until 1934, but after 1934, he became bad. Why? Why he became bad? Because basically what Khrushchev did, he denounced Stalin and his great terror. Remember, the major goal of the great terror was the communist bureaucracy because Stalin wanted to cleanse the communist bureaucracy and the nomenclature and bring his people, new people. Okay. He wanted to cleanse the old Bolshevik guard, okay? And that's what, in the eyes of Khrushchev, was bad, because he and his cronies, bureaucrats, communist bureaucrats, elite, suffered during the Great Terror. They felt insecure, right? So they wanted to enjoy security. So, Soviet communist nomenclature. But at the same time, 
he said whatever happened before 1934 it was good the terror against kulaks um phasing out merchants capitalists clergy oh it was good it was good okay so this partial destalinization but still again the fact that khrushchev denounced the cult of personality the fact that khrushchev um allowed some limited uh, a leeway for writers poets musicians to kind of exercise i wouldn't say freedom but at least uh, some of them could write what they wanted to write yeah not on not completely but to some extent with official permission with official permission uh, a few books were published about gulag which was very unusual okay in the totalitarian country okay just indirectly khrushchev made the first cracks in the building of communism that is why after 1956 that's the time when khrushchev denounced stalin as, the, as a criminal okay after 1956 we have a bunch of communists in, in western countries live in communist countries okay the image of socialism overall image of socialism started to decline in the eyes of the people in the west okay but the picture was totally different in china okay so the chinese um, the new kids on the block chinese communists just started to feel the taste of this um, communist radicalism okay radical communist movement uh, took over power in, Ch in china and mao actually wanted to imitate stalin so i'm going to be the same like um, a father of the nation building communism okay that was the assumption and whatever stalin had suggested before collectivization industrialization cultural revolution was planned to be done in china okay that's what mao wanted to do and here khrushchev comes and denounces cult of personality okay in china we have at that we have uh, we had at that time a new cult of personality growing gradually okay the cult of personality of mao okay he was now trying the military tunic of stalin so mao who was watching what was going on in the soviet union he was very upset very upset he didn't like khrushchev destalinization in fact he despite he came to despise khrushchev and when khrushchev told um, him when he was a visit a visiting moscow and uh, other people that we need to do something for people build uh, apartments for them to give them amenities give them more food um mao in despise called soviet communism goulash goulash communism just to, as a, a phrase of despise see that goulash that oh, you're taking care of food the need consumer needs so we in china we don't care about it we want to be more radical we want to do like comrade stalin had done you know that was the assumption so basically mao wants to say i'm taking the torch of communism right now you bastard khrushchev you're a traitor you're a traitor you're a revisionist remember we talked about revisionists so now the soviets in the eyes of the chinese communists radical chinese communists appeared to be revisionists okay that is why we have these clashes between the soviet union and china okay at first a little bit but then more and more and by the early 1960s we have a, a big ideological wedge between the soviet union and china okay mao eventually denounced destalinization he said comrade stalin was good and uh, to defy the soviet destalinization chinese in fact continued to publish stalin's works and i should have brought it here on chinese propaganda posters they depicted um, four fake profiles of four faces with mao's face on the side uh, who were these profiles marx engels lenin and stalin so four profiles and with mao's adorn face on the side that was one of the most popular posters in china so by 
uh, printing this imagery, the Chinese um, communists wanted to send the message that we recognize Stalin, so he is our hero. See, it's interesting ideological gap between Soviets and the Chinese. Okay. <clears throat> One of the most important issues for the Soviets and the Chinese, uh, for the Soviet and Chinese communists to fight over was uh, peaceful coexistence. Khrushchev essentially denounced Stalinist militaristic policy. Again, he didn't want to make a complete turnaround. What Khrushchev said that um, unlike Stalin, who believed there would be an imminent war between the West and the world of communism, the house of communism and the house of capitalism. So Stalin had this Manichaean, this black and white picture that there would be no peace between capitalism and uh, communism. Unlike this black and white vision, Khrushchev said, it's very dangerous to talk like this. So we live in a time of uh, nuclear weapons, okay? So we can destroy each other. So we shouldn't uh, come up with these reckless slogans. So the best way to go is peaceful coexistence. So let's uh, peaceful exist. Capitalist Western countries and Eastern communist countries. Let's peacefully compete. Since Khrushchev was still a diehard communist, he believed that communism, communism economically would be able to overdo capitalism. That was his assumption. He said, in fact, he told Nixon, Khrushchev, in 1959 during famous kitchen debate. There was a kitchen debate in Moscow between um, Vice President Nixon, who came to Moscow with an American exhibit to show off um, accomplishments of the United States for Soviet consumers, okay? And um, millions of Soviet people visited America, this travel in American exhibit. So Khrushchev came to visit this American exhibit and um, Khrushchev and Nixon, they engaged each other in a conversation. Nixon started showing Khrushchev a bunch of amenities like kitchen uh, sink, um, a stove, a fridge, ice making, uh, ice make, um, ice cream maker, to Khrushchev uh, bragging about accomplishments of the Western capitalism, and uh, Khrushchev responded bragging about the Soviet accomplishments. Okay, and um, <laughs> in fact, during this kitchen debate, Khrushchev said, "Why do you need such?" Um, uh, uh, crazy things like ice cream maker or uh, a juice making machine, you know, you, you don't need it, you know, it's like, a, it's unnecessary luxury. So we don't, in Soviet Union, we don't do this. We only have something that people really need, you know, so that's how his mind was working, you know. Little did he know that a human knowledge, remember, the human knowledge works in different ways, you know, that human minds in, invent a bunch of things. And some of these things become obsolete, let's say the stupid thing like banana holder or whatever, I don't know, uh, a garlic peeler, you know, at least I know about the existence of banana holder. Like uh, for me, it's a stupid thing, but it should exist because it shows this um, diversity of human knowledge, something kind of becomes obsolete, but something becomes popular and that's what consumers embrace. So Khrushchev uh, didn't understand this, he said, only what we need we produce, okay? So it's an interesting uh, comparison between the mindset of a uh, one-dimensional communist who thinks in this one-dimensional zero-sum game of I'm going to do what ne needs to be done. Okay, are you sure that needs to be done? <laughs> it's from your viewpoint. Unlike um, people from who came from the West who thought in, uh, and some of them still, think fortune in terms of um, diversity. When I talk di about diversity, I mean real diversity, not ideological diversity. Diversity of knowledge, diversity of ideologies, diversity of views, when uh, diversity of scientific knowledge, when no uh, scientific consensus is accepted as an ironclad ideological mantra. Okay. 
only human knowledge in its diverse form can succeed. But it's another issue. Um, anyway, the okay, Khrushchev, communist, Nixon, representative of this Western capitalism. And on the other hand, we have this um, helter-skelter guy, uh, Comrade Mao, okay, Chairman Mao in China, who even, um, for whom even Khrushchev was, was not radical enough, okay? So, Chinese communists were radical communists, so to them, even uh, Khrushchev appeared uh, revisionist. Okay, they could not accept Khrushchev because they thought he was not militant enough. It's a very interesting position because he betrayed Comrade Stalin, he be betrayed the radical cause. Okay, um, see, Khrushchev was still ready to, and some Soviet leaders were uh, ready to engage in, uh, into debates with the U.S. Rep representatives. They had this dialogue, and the major message of Khrushchev was: Yes, we don't like. Um, uh, yes, we hate you. Western capitalist, but we don't need to destroy each other. We shouldn't have war. We need to have peaceful coexistence. We, are, we need to trade with each other. We need to uh, send people to each other. And by the way, under Khrushchev, they started the first Soviet tourism. For the first time, some Soviet regular citizens were allowed to travel to the West, not individually, but as parts of the groups. So Khrushchev said, we are going to beat you to um, beat you anyway, because our economic system is more productive. That's what Khrushchev convinced. Okay. We should engage in a peaceful competition, in a peaceful coexistence with the West, which this message very much upset the Chinese communists. So Mao was very upset. He said, how come you betrayed the cause of Comrade Stalin? there should be an imminent war between the West and communism. So you're a traitor. In fact, uh, Mao on several occasions suggested that Khrushchev gives a, a nuclear bomb, the secret of a nuclear bomb to China. So he, on one occasion, Mao directly asked Khrushchev, can you share with us uh, the secrets of the nuclear bomb because we needed two to confront the West. And when Khrushchev refused, that's what uh, very much upset Mao Zedong, okay? And then um, Mao Zedong said, so why don't we attack Western countries? Khrushchev said, how can you speak like this? It's suicidal because both sides have nuclear weapons. He's, and Mao said, so what? If, and he literally said this, Mao Zedong. Let's assume that during nuclear holocaust, like 30% of uh, population in the globe would be gone. Still, those who remained would live under communism. So it's a very societal, cannibalistic philosophy. On another occasion, he said, we Chinese, we're so many, even uh, after this disastrous results of nuclear war, we are going to survive, unlike some other nations. So let's bomb Americans. Let's bomb and Germans or UK. So a very reckless approach. And he even said, Mao Zedong, United States is a paper tiger. So why are you afraid, Khrushchev, to attack them? It's a very, very arrogant and reckless approach. One of the major domestic projects for Mao during this time, during this time, during this growing split with the Soviet Union was so-called the Great Leap Forward. Okay. Essentially, uh, the best way to understand what it was, and I here I have to mention that a few books essentially put this event in the context of uh, world uh, communism. Okay. Unfortunately, histories of in history of China, when you take um, Chinese history, Asian history, they don't put this event in perspective. But you have to view the great leap forward in the context of development of Stalinist system. So it was an extension. It was a continuation of ideological mantra of Stalinism about collectivization. Okay, That's the best way to understand what uh, happened in China at the end of 1950s, beginning of 1960s. Okay, 
since Mao wanted to be the leader in the communist movement after Stalin. Okay? He wanted to outdo the Soviet Union. He wanted to show that we are the best communists, so we can lead the people. So one of the major aspects of his uh, radical militant policy, militant Stalinism, was collectivization. But what he wanted to do, he wanted to outdo the Soviets. He wanted to outdo the Soviet collectivization. Okay. Remember, Stalin forced uh, Soviet peasants, Russian, Ukrainian, and the rest of nationalities, peasants. He forced them to, um, he locked them in collective farms, headed by Communist Party workers and um, guarded by secret police okay and he declared war on the peasants stalin and more than what five million peasants were sacrificed for the soviet industrial revolution as a result of stalin's collectivization so five million more than five million people died as a result of a man-made famine okay but stalin uh and even stalin understood that even though the Soviets confiscated practically all grain from the peasants, they needed to give peasants something. So in 1934, Stalin allowed Russian, Ukrainian peasants to maintain individual gardens in front or in the back of their cabins, houses, okay? They were not called private plots, okay? There was no private land ownership, but individual gardens you know, where peasants could keep... Um, a chicken, a couple of cows, they could grow produce. And in fact, uh, these individual gardens, which occupied only 4% of agricultural land, gave 30% of Soviet produce. Okay, just a remark on the margins about where people's incentives lay. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about China, so let's go back to China. See, Mao wanted to outdo Stalin, so he did not allow even this stuff, individual gardens. So his goal was to round up all Chinese peasants and put them in communes. In communes. At least in Stalin collective farms, people could live in their own cabins. They could have, uh, they could eat on their own. Okay. They could wear different clothing. But here... In case of China, it was an extreme collectivization, I would say. So uh, in the countryside, people were encouraged to eat together in communal diners, to, in some commun communes, even sleep together, okay, of course, women and men separately, to wear the same clothing, okay, the bl blue robes for both for men and women, in order to create this equity, equality, when nobody would be jealous of each other. So when we wear the same robes, blue robes, who is going to be jealous, right? Nobody is going to be jealous. Everybody is equal, okay? Wonderful world, right? Um, people should work together. No individual land plots, you know. We don't need to, kind of, in, no compromises. Communes, see and the name for these peasant collectives, I don't remember the exact number of these collectives. Uh, I have this exact number in my book on socialism, which I'm working on right now. Um, I need to look it up. But um, uh, 25,000, 30,000 communes were created in China, big communes. People were encouraged work together, uh, eat together, do things together. So even share utensils, okay, and wear the same clothing. Um, like in case of Stalin, these com these communes were issued quotas, so they had to provide a specified amount of uh, rice. In in case of Russia, it was uh, what wheat, rice. In case of China, it was rice. Rice, the major crop of China, if you forgot. Okay. Uh, basically, the same uh, we have the same disastrous results um, like in the Soviet Union. But when I said the same, more disastrous results. Let me put this way: it would be more a better way to describe. Okay. Mao had the rice confiscated from peasants. The uh, killing quotas were established, and of course, peasants couldn't feed themselves because the, the rice was taken from them 
And to make a long story short, by 1962, 30, more than 30 million people died. More than 30 million people died. It was more than in Soviet Union. Remember, 5 million in the Soviet Union and here 30 million. It's not exact number. If you want to get more or less exact number, you need to read a book by uh, Decotter. Decotter. He is um, an English-American historian who currently works in Stanford University. Uh, his name is spelled uh, with double T, Decotter, D-I-K-O-T-T-E-R, -T -T -E Decotter. So Google this name, type China, and a few books will show up. The best books about history of China, the most complete, because he worked with documents. He was able actually to produce more or less exact figure about people who died. So he is the number one historian to go to, okay. So again, uh, one more time, I want to repeat this. An attempt, the great leap forward was an attempt to outdo Soviets. Outdo Soviets. Since the results were so disastrous, 30 million people died. And... Uh, no miraculous well-being was produced just a reckless experiment because mao shared the same marxist leninist idea about miraculous results of collective agriculture okay and in fact he reached the same uh, he came to the same uh, result which we had seen in the soviet union he simply uprooted the chinese agriculture uprooted chinese agriculture again which shows that history doesn't teach anybody anything. People don't learn from history. In fact, even more so, uh, Mao was an ideologically driven pe person, that was driven by ideology of Marxism-Leninism. What happened, uh, several top communists started to question Mao's policy. They, um, in fact, uh, wanted to make peace with the Soviets. They said, we don't need these reckless policies. Okay? They tried to agree with Soviet revisionists, and Mao didn't like it. So he was afraid that he might be ditched, so he might lose his power. So like Stalin, Mao acted like Stalin. He also wanted to purge the Communist Party from old bureaucrats and establish his personal dictatorship. Same thing, same thing. Okay, to establish his cult of personality, to make sure that uh, not only his um, uh, enemies uh, would be phased out, but even potential enemies would be eradicated. Same goal as Stalin had pursued. Okay, no wonder uh, that Mao came up with the slogan, bombard the headquarters. Headquarters, it means revisionists within the Communist Party. Okay, we need to get rid of them, revisionists. Soviet revisionists. In fact, fight against Soviet revisionism became one of the major ideological mantra of Maoism. Okay, they kept repeating Chinese propaganda. Re kept repeating, "We fight against Soviet revisionism and Western imperialism. Western imperialism, Soviet revisionism. Soviet revisionism, Western imperialism." Thousands of times. Okay. I still remember when I was um, a young man in the. Uh, still in Russia, I was listening to some Chinese radio in Russian. It was hilarious to see how they tried to um, indoctrinate. Of course, we, we were laughing at this. Indoctrinate some people in other socialist countries about radical communism. So blaming the Soviets and not being communist enough. Okay, Mao used um, uh, college and um, high school youth to attack the communist and state bureaucracy, this old nomenclature, okay? He mobilized, especially college youth, urban college youth were mobilized. They were encouraged to bend together uh, as red guards. He called them red guards. And he actually showed up in front of them, cheered them. And he said, get rid of these um, old guards they're revisionists they're traitors bourgeois people like capitalists so we need to eradicate them in, in fact what happened the groups of these red guards they roamed the streets 
of Beijing, Shanghai, Nanking, the major uh, Chinese cities, and they uh, broke into stores, uh, destroyed furniture, raided the houses of uh, chief uh, Communist Party bureaucrats, dragged them outside, beating them, or most frequently they humiliated them. They put some kind of clown caps on them and forced them to repent. Uh, force them to repeat, you know, the communism is good, we love Comrade Mao. If people refused to, like, they could approach, for instance, people, uh, occasional people who were outside and you know, forcing them to participate in their demonstrations, whatever they were doing. If people refused to um, say uh, Comrade Mao is good, so we love Comrade Mao, so they could spit on these people, they could beat them, okay? Um, in some colleges, students attacked the presence of universities, uh, beating their professors, okay? Uh, school children were beating their principals. So the gangs uh, of uh, these uh, red guards roamed the streets, and a lot of properties, um, state properties, were destroyed, wrecked. You know, the damage was horrendous. Some factories... In some fa some factories had to stop working because they were forced to express solidarity with Red Guards who supported the Comrade Mao, you know. And eventually, <laughs> entire economy, economic life in major Chinese cities stopped because people were intimidated. If you, uh, you had to be politically correct, if you did not participate in these mass demonstrations, in these mass protests, so you could be blamed in being a traitor and a bourgeois person, a capitalist, a revisionist, a Soviet revisionist, okay? Um, the madness, ideological madness escalated so much that people were arrested, beaten by these Red Guards. If, for instance, they had at home some you know, books published in English from the United States, or if they had some dollar bills, or if people wore some clothing they didn't like, like if people wore suits, it, they could be beaten, spit on, because it appeared bourgeois in the eyes of the Red Guards, okay? To be a good Red Guard, you have to wear these um, symbols of Chinese communism with red kerchiefs, um, blue robes, you know, working class outfit to show off that you are a working class, what, uh, girl or guy. So basically, youth, youth, uh, youth was unleashed and uh, Mao unscrupulously um, speculated on the desire of young people to make changes. So he gained them hope and he said, change the world. And again, the ch uh, the change was understood as attacking, uh, raiding people, silencing people who disagreed with the regime. Okay, that was uh, what was done. Red guards. Okay, and in history, what was done by Mao and his uh, loyal agents at that time, red guards, these young men and women, against regular people against uh, existing uh, bureaucracy, against uh, whatever targets they defined for themselves, became known, uh, known as the Cultural Revolution. So what I'm just describing became known as the Cultural Revolution. Of course, the major goal for Mao was to get rid of his opponents within the Communist Party. That is why, for example, um, One of the Chinese communists who took over after Mao died in 1976, who actually started reforms to reform this insane radical communism of Comrade Mao. And the name of this guy was Deng Xiaoping. He was the one who disagreed with this great leap forward, who behind Mao's back tried to criticize Mao Zedong. And Mao send him to the countryside, <laughs> away, exile him to the countryside, okay? And in fact, I think the son, the, yes, the son of um, Deng Xiaoping, he actually uh, committed suicide. He threw himself from uh, a window, being ostracized by the gang of Red Guards, a group of this youth 
who intimidated him, who blamed him and being a bourgeois person, a capitalist, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> so he was driven to a suicide. <clears throat> In, in fact, the uh, entire country plunged into a state of anarchy. It was a severe damage to the economy. So eventually, like in case of Stalin, remember Stalin in 1939 realized that his great terror, in fact, became detrimental for economic life within the country because thousands, thousands of engineers had been arrested. The people were executed, 700,000 people in uh, Russia sent to Gulag. Same thing is here. Uh, same same thing happened uh, in China. Okay, entire economic life was disrupted, and uh, at some point, particularly in 1971, Mao realized that economically China was losing. The econ economy was going down. So what he did <laughs> when. Uh, the situation became so desperate, he actually asked army, Chinese uh, people, Chinese Liberation Army, that's the official name to the present day, by the way, that's the official name of the Chinese army, it's called People's Liberation Army. So the Chinese People's Liberation Army was asked to step in and what round up Red Guards. <laughs> so Red Guards were essentially rounded up and they were loaded on trucks or into buses and shipped away to the countryside to learn from peasants who lived in communes and wearing these black, uh, wearing these blue robes. The major uh, sacred book, the major ideological book uh, to be read, to be uh, quoted, was um, a little red book. So here you can see uh, a cover a cover from a high school a textbook. Okay, that's a cover that depicts these three red guards, activists. Okay, and one of them holds this Mao's um, little red book. It's a basically a book of uh, Comrade Mao's quotations, quotes on different occasions about agriculture, about heavy industry, about ideological life, about youth. So the brief quotes, okay, brief quotes in fact i have it here in my hand i want to show it to you okay it's uh, see right here it's actually translated in english that's how it looks okay quotations from chairman mao zedong it's a very thin book slim book it's a bunch of quotations on different occasions okay well you can ask me right now why do why am i showing you this stuff right Again, the reason I'm showing you this stuff because I want to make a point. Okay, if you studied Chinese history, Chinese um, uh, medieval history, you know that one of the major sacred books in old China and in the modern China before communism was what Confucius Analects. Confucius, remember the guy who had uh, um, established or actually opened the doors to Confucianism, the major uh, moral philosophy of China. Okay, and um, Confucius, this sage, ancient sage, had a bunch of quotations on different occasions, and eventually, by modern times, uh, these quotations were published and distributed in the form of book, or in the form of a book. It became known as Confucius Analects to be studied by um, Chinese students, by bureaucrats, by scribes. Okay, I repeat again, Confucius Analects, a small book that contained Confucius quotations. So here we have the same stuff. Of course, it was a communist book, but the, um, the essence, it's about essence and the form, okay? A new wine in old bottle. A new wine in the old bottle. See, you see the same format of this little red book with a bunch of quotations. Only instead of Confucius, we have Comrade Mao. Instead of Confucius quotations, we have communist quotations from Comrade Mao. Okay? A same format. Because 
keeping this Confucius format for this communist book created this continuity. So it, it resonated with the Chinese tradition. So that is why I'm using this occasion to show you how it worked in real life. Okay. Anyway, at some point, at some point, Chinese communists became engaged in a, lit, um, a literal warfare within Soviets, skirmishes, because two powers uh, which drifted away from each other, Soviet Union and China, this radical Chinese communism and um, slightly reformed uh, Soviet um, real socialism, as it became known. Um, Mao, in fact, said that these Soviet revisions, they're so dangerous, they might join the American imperialists, so they are our enemies. And he also started um, arguing that in the uh, 19th century, Russia was the country which occupied uh, northern parts of China, which was correct. Okay, so he said, we need to return our Chinese lands back. So uh, Comrade Mao started being a communist. He started to play on to play on what? On Chinese nationalism. Okay, so the crowds of uh, zealous Maoist activists decided to go to um, cross the Russian uh, Soviet Chinese border to occupy um, several spots along the Soviet Chinese border that historically belonged to China. Okay, but the Soviet troops who were guarding this territory didn't want to back off. So we have uh, military skirmishes when Chinese and Soviet troops engaged each other and killed each other. Okay, it did not escalate in the open um, uh, wide warfare. Okay, but thousands of people did die. Like uh, between two and three thousand people died from both sides. In 1969, that was the uh, confrontation, the major year when the border skirmishes took place. Okay. So that would be the end of the story about the emergence and evolution of um, Chinese communism, which uh, reached this radical forms. Of course, after Mao died. He died in 1976. Chinese communism was reformed. And we are going to talk about it. It's another story. You will find out what eventually happened in uh, post-Mao post era when China did uh, change the gears and decided to part with the radical communism but I repeat it's a different story it's another story which uh, I will cover at the end of the semester thank you for your attention and I will see you next time